What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. Today's episode was released early to premium subscribers last month, and it features two guests who have both been on the podcast before, John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt, whose previous appearances I've linked to in the related section of today's episode page on our website. They truly need no introduction, at least not for anyone remotely familiar with the field of international relations. They're both prominent members of the so-called realist school, and their views have often run counter to the prevailing orthodoxy in Washington, which I would broadly characterize as being proudly interventionist. Professor Mearsheimer especially has generated a lot of attention for his views on Ukraine, which went viral after the invasion earlier this year. Just one of his videos on YouTube alone, which I've linked to in the summary notes, has been seen over 26 million times. And one of the things that I asked him about today is not just what that experience has been like, but why he thinks his views have resonated so strongly with the public. And if there's a connection between people's views on Ukraine and their positions on the larger culture wars that seem to be dividing so many of us in Western society today. The conversation veers far beyond Ukraine. Ukraine is just a touching off point for a much larger discussion about the future of great power competition, the endurance of the alliance between Russia and China, America's pivot to Asia, and how Russia's invasion of Ukraine could actually make that easier. And just generally speaking, what should the goals of American foreign policy be? What do we want to achieve with our military and diplomatic influence in the world? As most of you already know, Hidden Forces is listener supported. I don't rely on advertisers or commercial sponsors. So if you want early access to episodes like this one, as well as additional premium content, like episode overtimes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which are comprehensive educational documents full of links to resource materials, quotes, and highlighted excerpts from each and every episode. Visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to one of our premium content tiers. So with all that said, I leave all of you to listen to this truly special conversation with two great scholars of international relations, John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt. John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt, welcome to Hidden Forces. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, nice to talk with you again. Yeah, so the first person was John, the second one was Stephen. Have you guys ever been on a podcast together before? I'm sure you've done interviews together because you had a book you published years ago, but have you ever been on a podcast together? Not that I remember. Yeah, I can't remember either where we've done a podcast. We've done lots of interviews together. And certainly when the Israel lobby came out, we did lots yeah. Lots of talks and lots of interviews together. But I think never a podcast. Yeah, as I will have mentioned in the introduction, you guys are, you know, not to blow steam up your whatever, but you guys really are kind of giants in both in the international relations space, but specifically among people in the realist school. You've both been on the podcast before, as I will have mentioned as well. So people can go back to those previous episodes if they want to sort of get your individual philosophies, but if you could quickly just kind of introduce yourselves and where you come from philosophically. John, let's start with you. Well, I teach at the University of Chicago. I've been here for 40 years, and I think it's fair to say that I'm a canonical realist. I believe that states largely act according to sort of balance of power logic. I've written on a wide variety of subjects. My most important book, I think, is probably The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, where I lay out my basic realist theory. Steve and I, of course, wrote The Israel Lobby in article form, and then The Israel Lobby in U.S. Foreign Policy in book form. We also worked together in opposing the Iraq War uh, before March 19th, 2003. And since then, he and I have both, in our own way, written about and criticized American foreign policy. And I think our views on Ukraine are just the latest manifestation of our dissatisfaction with the way the American foreign policy establishment uh, formulates uh, U.S. grand strategy. 
As for me, I am also a, a realist, uh, card carrying, although you could probably find some disagreements between John and me. He is the canonical offensive realist, and I'm often associated with what's sometimes called defensive realism, especially based on my first book, The Origins of Alliances. I uh, started my teaching career at Princeton University, then went to University of Chicago, where John and I were colleagues for 10 years. Uh, I left Chicago in 1999 and came to the Kennedy School, where I've been ever since. In addition to the things I've done with John, I've published a couple of books on different aspects of American foreign policy. In 2005, there was the book Taming American Power, which was really about how the rest of the world was reacting to America's remarkable position of primacy at that moment. And then in 2018, as John alluded to, I published The Hell of Good Intentions, which is about uh, very much about the foreign policy establishment and how I felt it was clinging to a set of policies that had not worked very well for 20 years but we weren't able to correct. I also write a more or less weekly column for Foreign Policy Magazine, something I've been doing for, I think, about 12 or 13 years now. And that is my opportunity to comment occasionally on what's just going on in the headlines, but also broader events and trends that are happening in international politics. Very time consuming and also a lot of fun. And I'm an avid reader of those. So you mentioned that there is a distinction between you and John's view of realism that of defensive and offensive. Can you just explain what that is for listeners? Yeah, I think the principal difference is John is really a pure structuralist, right? It's the, the distribution of capabilities that really matters most. And for John, a critical part of his argument is that because intentions cannot be known with certainty, you can never be sure what another country might do, especially another powerful country might do. There's a strong incentive for states to compete for power, to try and be number one, because you want to be number one in a world where you don't know intentions and where states can hurt each other. And this is a very powerful theory, very simple, has a lot going for it as well. For defensive realists like me, two main differences. First, although we recognize that states cannot know intentions with 100% certainty, we believe that states can still make intelligent judgments about intentions, that we are more worried about, say, Russian power today because of what we think Putin's intentions might be than we are worried about, say, British power, even though Britain has nuclear weapons and could wipe us off the face of the earth if it wanted to. We just don't think Britain's likely to do that anytime soon. A second difference is that defensive realists believe in some circumstances, it's possible to construct military postures that are less threatening to others, that don't have the capacity to conquer others easily, that are primarily good for defending your own soil, but not good for doing much of anything else. And nuclear weapons, by the way, are a perfect illustration of this. You can defend yourself by deterring attacks with nuclear weapons, but they're not very useful for conquering other countries. So defensive realists, although we see the world as highly competitive, you know, peace is not going to break out anytime soon, nonetheless believe that states, if they wish, can construct somewhat more benign or more peace-prone international orders than I think an offensive realist might believe. John can now tell you if he disagrees with my characterization of our differences. No, I think it's an excellent characterization. I would just add one point that you didn't mention. And that is that for both offensive and defensive realists, for any realist, the fact that the system is anarchic matters enormously. And when you say the system is anarchic, that means there's no higher authority that sits above states that states can turn to if they get into trouble. In other words, if you dial 911 in the international system, there's nobody at the other end. That, for both defensive realists and offensive realists, creates very powerful incentives to make sure that you are faced with a favorable balance of power, right? It's a self-help world, we realists say. As my mother used to say when I was a little boy, God helps those who help themselves. It's that basic logic that applies in large part because the world is anarchic. There's no 911. And again, that applies to both defensive and offensive realists. Is it both of your views that a single state would be physically incapable under any theoretical circumstances to dominate the international system permanently so as to alter the basic nature of it and those basic assumptions around anarchism? <laughs> 
I would say just very quickly, it's impossible to do it temporarily, <laughs> certainly not permanently. The planet is just too big. And there are all these national entities out there that are infused with nationalism that don't want to be conquered. So if you set out to conquer the world and dominate it, you're going to run into a whole heck of a lot of trouble. I would just say never say never. I mean, you don't know what will happen in the next thousand years. But I think the prospect of true global hegemony is impossible in my lifetime and probably impossible in yours too, Dimitri, and, <laughs> uh, and possibly anybody else who's currently alive today, no matter how young they are and how long they live. Would it be fair to characterize American foreign policy after the end of the Cold War as aspirational global hegemony that the United States, in other words, wanted to be on the other end of that 911 call, John? I think the answer is basically yes. I mean, Steve and I and many of our friends argue that American foreign policy during the unipolar moment, roughly from 1990 to 2017, was liberal hegemony. And there's the word hegemony. And the idea was that what we were going to do is create a world in our own image, and we would be the dominant power in that world. We would go to great lengths to make sure that every state on the planet, including Russia and China, were liberal democracies, right? We would do everything we could to integrate states from here, there, and everywhere into the liberal economic order we had created during the Cold War. And we would work hard to get countries all across the globe into international institutions so they would be rule-abiding citizens. They would be responsible stakeholders in Robert Zellick's famous terminology. So this policy of liberal hegemony was basically designed to make the United States the dominant power on the globe. Yeah, I would just add to that, though, that I think in the vision of people in that period, they didn't think the United States was going to have to do that much policing, right? Because if everyone became democratic and everyone was bought into all of these institutions, there wouldn't be a whole lot of trouble. We would be sort of the residual sheriff, if you will, but we wouldn't have to be very active. The image of hegemony here was not a coercive one, if it all worked out. We weren't going to be, you know, the Roman Empire. We were going to be a, a very benevolent hegemon with a very light touch because in the, again, the vision of those who advocated for this, the rest of the world kind of wanted to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. The wind was at our back. All the historical trends were moving in the right direction. So this was going to be relatively easy to do and therefore would not be a highly coercive operation. And I think, by the way, Steve's view that he just laid out is reflected very clearly in Francis Fukuyama's famous article, The End of History. If you were to read that, it says in effect what Steve just said. Yeah. Would you say that also the thinking at the time was that the United States had achieved or could achieve escape velocity when it came to power and power projections such that any possible peer competitor wouldn't even think to try to challenge the United States and to go down the path of making the types of long-term investments like the Chinese have that would eventually be able to challenge it as a global hegemon. Yeah, there's no question that, for example, that was the logic in the famous Bush administration draft defense guidance of 1992. This is the elder President Bush. And this draft defense guidance, which was subsequently partially repudiated, basically laid out exactly what you said, that we should be maintain a position of power so great that potential competitors think it's just going to be too hard to catch up to the United States. That, and they had in mind, by the way, countries like Japan and Germany, not so much countries like Russia or China. And you even see this logic, by the way, much later in the second Bush administration, George W. Bush, uh, where its 2002 national security strategy explicitly says that if China tries to pursue a great power status through military competition, it will be following an outmoded path. The Chinese should concentrate on getting rich, but not on trying to compete with the United States militarily. So I think that logic was in a lot of people's minds in this period. Do you think that American foreign policy elites in the 1990s completely missed the perspective and intentions of members of the Chinese Communist Party who 
and this is actually also a continuation of my question, who always felt that conflict with the United States was inevitable? Well, my view is that by pursuing a policy widely known as engagement, we believe that by making China rich and incorporating it into international institutions, that would eventually lead to China becoming a liberal democracy, looking like the United States. And then we wouldn't have to worry about the problems that you just described regarding the Communist Party, because the Communist Party would be pushed aside by liberal democracy. And since liberal democracies don't fight other liberal democracies, we would have world peace and we wouldn't have to worry about China, as powerful as it would be, acting like a peer competitor because it would be in effect defanged. It would be a liberal democracy. Of course, it didn't work out the way the architects of engagement thought that it would work out. And that includes Republicans as well as Democrats. I mean, George W. Bush played as important a role as Bill Clinton did in turning China into a peer competitor. And the end result, of course, is that we are in real trouble today with regard to China. So this actually is a kind of leads me towards an opportunistic pivot to Russia, because it, this is something that I've never been able to to answer. And I don't know that either of you will give a definitive answer to this question. But one of the things I've struggled to understand is why the United States chose engagement with China, but over time chose, I would say chose, other people could use a different word, but chose to lean towards confrontation with Russia, when by some analyses, you could say that it would have been in our interest to have a more cooperative relationship with the Russians if that were possible, because ultimately our primary rival is China, and that's where the United States has decided to focus its attention. How do you think about the nature of the US-Russian relationship and and why over time it deteriorated so badly to lead us to where we are today, where the Russians are now bogged down in a war in Ukraine, the Americans and the Europeans are sending arms and support to the Ukrainians, and we could find ourselves very quickly in, a, in an escalatory ladder that could lead to, God forbid, uh, nuclear conflict. This is a great question, and there's lots to be to say about it. I mean, I'll I'll give my swing at it, and then John can chime in. I mean, I think that the whole question of why the United States and NATO ultimately chose to adopt a path of enlargement, and then eventually to make that an open-ended commitment that we would just keep expanding as, as far as we could, is still a complicated question that is not fully explained. And why we did it with one and not the other is a great question as well. I think very quickly, we didn't think of enlarging our uh, sphere of alliances in Asia in the 1990s because there were no obvious candidates, first of all, and we didn't take the threat from China very seriously in that period. Now, we didn't see Russia as threatened in the 1990s either. But I think there were several things going on. First of all, there were a number of Eastern European countries that began pushing for this rather quickly. They wanted to get into NATO. They wanted to get close to the European Union because they knew Russia wasn't going away geographically. And that was a hedge against what might happen in the future. I think within NATO, there was a concern that the alliance needed a new mission. Now that the Cold War is over, is it going to fall apart? What's it going to do? And this gave it a new project. Domestic Domestic politics played a role here in particular in shifting Bill Clinton's views. Bill Clinton wasn't sure if he wanted to support NATO enlargement. And it's worth remembering that his Secretary of Defense, William Perry, opposed NATO enlargement because he thought it would be destabilizing. It would undermine the relationship with Russia, would undermine some of the programs we had going to bring Russia's uh, nuclear weapons under more reliable control, etc. He wanted the so-called partnership for peace, not NATO enlargement. Bill Clinton eventually decided that he could win some votes in the 96 election by appealing to various ethnic groups in the United States with ties to Eastern Europe. So he did that as well. And then finally, within the American foreign policy elite, there was this very powerful belief that if you could bring more countries into NATO, this would strengthen 
these new democracies in Eastern Europe and create a vast zone of peace. That was the phrase that was used in Eastern Europe because no one would ever be willing to challenge NATO and that would solidify democracy there. And because Russia was so weak in the 1990s, really in free fall, people believed there really wasn't very much they could do about it. Right, that there was no real downside. And you could keep bringing countries in because the guarantee would never be challenged. Who's going to take on NATO? We would also never have to deliver on these commitments. You could extend a guarantee to the Baltic states, which were hard to defend militarily, but no one would ever ask us to cash the check because no one would ever bother to challenge NATO. So what turned out to be a momentous strategic decision never really got a full hearing. And uh, the United States, I now think, and others, of course, are paying the price of that mistake. Just to build on what Steve said, it's very important to understand that the United States did not have a confrontational policy toward Russia until February 22nd, 2014, when the Ukraine crisis broke out. One might think that the first tranche of NATO expansion in 1999, second tranche of NATO expansion in 2004, were aimed at containing an aggressive Russia. Nothing could be further from the truth. We did not view Russia as a threat until 2014. There's no question that we were contemptuous of Russia's security concerns, right? The United States didn't pay much attention to Russian complaints about NATO expansion, withdrawal from the ABM treaty, and so forth and so on. But we did not have a confrontational policy until the Ukraine crisis broke out in 2014. At that point, we did a 180 degree turn. That went a long way towards poisoning relations. The second thing that happened was the 2016 election. The Democrats lost, Hillary Clinton in particular lost, and the Democrats decided by and large to blame Russian interference mm. for her loss. They did not want to admit that it was because Hillary was a terrible candidate or Trump was an attractive candidate to a large chunk of Americans. So they blamed the Russians. This really inflamed large numbers of Americans in terms of their view towards Russia. And then the third thing that I think matters here is Putin's views on gays and his unwillingness to sort of go along with the social agenda that large chunks, if not almost all of the American elite believes in. It makes him look like an antediluvian figure. The end result of all this is that we have a Russophobia before the Ukraine crisis this December, December 2021. We have a Russophobia problem in this country that is really unprecedented. Then the Ukraine crisis breaks out and you get a war. And it's hard to imagine an improvement in US-Russian relations in my lifetime, maybe even in your lifetime, Dimitri. I mean, things have just gone so far south. It's really quite remarkable. But my point is, and this is, I think, consistent with everything Steve said, that it wasn't until 2014 that the real trouble began. But that was only the beginning. And then you had a number of subsequent developments that really made this situation terrible. So I, I think this is a good time to pivot to a conversation about Ukraine since you brought it up. But I do want to mention two things or comment on one thing and maybe mention something else. Stephen, in your answer, you talked about how we had extended all these commitments that we didn't feel that we would ever need to actually defend because we were completely, utterly dominant. We saw ourselves as so dominant in the international scene that no one would threaten, no one would dream to challenge us as we talked about. And what I think one of the challenges that American foreign policy faces today, it seems to me, is that we live in the world of these commitments that we've extended. We live in a world that's been shaped by the expectation of American intervention but yet America isn't as powerful or relative to other players in the world as it was, and we're not prepared or able to follow up on those commitments. And we've seen that over the course of multiple previous administrations. And I think that 
and again, I, I think, but I'm, I'm actually here to hear your points of view on this. When we discuss Ukraine, it seems to me that one of the reasons that, that the invasion of Ukraine happened is because Vladimir Putin and Russia perceived a certain level of weakness in the United States. Perhaps that was exacerbated by the pullout of Afghanistan, the divisions that emerged during the Trump administration between the transatlantic alliance, et cetera. That's something that I'd like you to consider in in response to my specific question about Ukraine. But I also want to mention one more thing that really um, emphasizes something that John said. And John, and you know this, that my professor of Soviet history was Stephen Cohen, the late Stephen Cohen. And I don't agree with Stephen, or I didn't agree with Stephen Cohen on everything, but he had been on the podcast once. And and one of the things that he said that really stuck with me and that I think has proven so true over time is that we have, quote, demonized Putin and we have Putinized Russia. And I do think that there was a kind of hysteria that emerged in the United States during the Trump years that led to a degree of Russophobia that then when we got the invasion of Ukraine, I feel like it was even harder to have a nuanced conversation about it because so many people had developed very clear views around Russia and Putin that were based in moral terms. Now, all of that said, and or all of that out of the way, rather, I want to ask both of you about Ukraine. I want to understand what you think are the deep causes of this conflict. You've mentioned NATO expansion. I'm also curious to what degree we could have avoided NATO expansion given the institutional imperatives of NATO, the need to, it was in itself an institution, it needed to do something, um, and it had interest groups, et cetera. What are the deep causes of the conflict? And then what do you feel precipitated it earlier this year? So there's the question of deep causes, and then there's the question of why they went on February 24th into Ukraine. Just on deep causes, the conventional wisdom in the United States, which is widely accepted, is that Putin is an imperialist. And what he is trying to do is either create a greater Russia or recreate something akin to the former Soviet Union. That's the conventional wisdom. That's wrong. There is, in my opinion, no evidence to support that. There's no evidence that he thought it was a good idea to incorporate Ukraine into Russia. There's no evidence that he thought Russia could do that. And there's no evidence that he intended to do that. In fact, all the evidence is that he recognized Ukraine as a sovereign state. The cause, the deep cause of this crisis was the West's effort, and here we're talking mainly about Washington's effort, to make Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's border. And that strategy had three prongs. The most prominent and most important was making Ukraine part of NATO. Then there was the effort to make Ukraine part of the EU. And then there was the effort to turn Ukraine into a liberal democracy, a pro-American liberal democracy. This was the famous Orange Revolution. That was the three-pronged effort. Putin made it unequivocally clear, and his lieutenants made it unequivocally clear that this was an existential threat to Russia and that Russia was not going to tolerate it. So that is what is the deep cause. Now, what precipitated this? Joe Biden moved into the White House in January of 2021. Joe Biden is a huge supporter of Ukraine, and he was deeply interested in bringing Ukraine into NATO, contrary to the argument that the whole issue of Ukraine and NATO was no longer a serious issue. This is simply not true. Zelensky bought on to that idea in 2021. And over the course of 2021, it was the fact that the Americans and the Ukrainians were interested in bringing Ukraine into NATO, making it a Western bulwark on Ukraine's border that caused the Russians to mobilize forces and put them on the borders of Ukraine. Then in December 2021, the Russians said they had enough. And they told us, if you want to settle this one, right, 
short of an invasion. You've got to give us a written guarantee that Ukraine will not become part of NATO and that you will not deploy Western weaponry in Ukraine. We refuse to do that. We refuse to even, even seriously consider it. And the end result is Putin said, okay. And on February 24th, he launched the war because he is determined to make sure that Ukraine does not become part of NATO. And if he has to wreck it to produce that outcome, he'll wreck it. And in fact, he is in the process of wrecking Ukraine. I want to add a couple of points just to amplify and maybe put what John said into context. Uh, first of all, in introducing this topic, Dimitri, you mentioned, you know, maybe this was something that Putin did because he thought the United States was weak. Uh, the withdrawal of Afghanistan, you know, were divided. There were some transatlantic divisions. And I think it's possible that Putin uh, badly miscalculated. But I don't think one ever wants to think that he thought the United States was weak. I mean, after all, look what's happened since the invasion. The United States States has basically opened the sluice gates and is showing exactly what we can do when we get motivated to try and help someone. We are pouring enormous amounts of equipment into Ukraine. We're doing it very rapidly as well. And publicly, that's the other thing that's very interesting in some cases. That's a separate case. And I do not believe Vladimir Putin was under any illusions about how powerful the United States and the United States and NATO together are. The United States has an economy that's more than 10 times larger than that of Russia, right? He understands that we're much more technologically sophisticated, that the American military is in fact substantially more capable than, than the Russian military, which of course is precisely why he was worried about the incorporation of Ukraine into a an alliance led by the United States. The second point I wanted to make was that in, I think it's very critical to try and understand the Russian view of all of this. And I think if you take the last 20 to 25 years, the message that the United States has been sending to Russia, whether or not we intended to deliberately, was basically that we don't have much respect for you and we don't have to listen to your views or opinions on very many issues. Right. So Every time NATO expanded, the Russians protested, said this was a bad idea. They regarded it as a threatening. It was going to lead to a breakdown of relations, et cetera. And we paid no attention. Back in 2001, 2002, the Bush administration left the ABM treaty that had been negotiated with the former Soviet Union. The Russians protested, said they regarded this as a bad step. We paid no attention uh, whatsoever. We did the same thing over the Libya intervention in 2011. The Russians abstained on the Security Council resolution because we said it was just about protecting civilians and not about regime change. And then we went ahead and did regime change. So we were basically saying to Russia over and over again, we don't have any respect for you. We don't think we have to take your opinions into account. Why does this matter? Because if a major power is treating you in that way, you do have to wonder what they might do next. They've had 20 years of showing a basic contempt for your views and for your concerns. And therefore, even if the United States did not, in fact, have any hostile intentions towards Russia itself, right, there was no reason by 2019, 2020, 2021 for the Russian elite to take that on faith. We'd suggested quite the contrary for quite some time. And I think that's a big part of what ultimately led Putin to do what was clearly immoral and risky operation. But you have to understand what led to it, what his motivations really were. So Stephen, one follow up to you, and then I want to follow up with John about something he said. Do you think that maybe they were encouraged, that Putin was encouraged because of his relationship with China, that he felt that he could do it? Uh, you know, there's been lots of speculation about what was said between Putin and Xi Jinping in the meetings that were held before the invasion. I think certainly feeling like China was likely to be supportive and certainly not opposed to it would have been helpful. I do not know what Putin would have done if Xi Jinping had told him, absolutely not, don't do this. It's a huge mistake. We won't support you. I don't think that's what Xi did. So I think support from China, you know, facilitated it or helped it. But I don't think that's the real motivation here. I think it's much more important to look at Russia's security concerns and the problem that they were attempting to solve. So, John, you mentioned NATO. We've mentioned NATO a bunch of times. 
How realistic was it for Putin to believe that Ukraine would enter NATO just based off the, the fact that they had developed such a close relationship with Germany and Germany certainly would not support it? And then in terms of a written guarantee, obviously, and Putin must know this, I mean, it's such a basic thing that American foreign policy doesn't really work like that. There's no president that can write a formal guarantee. And certainly in those types of circumstances, the United States was the executive branch was not going to cave to Putin's demands while he was sort of on the doorstep to, of Ukraine. How do you think about those two? Well, let me make three sets of comments in response to your points. First of all, whether or not Ukraine gets to join NATO doesn't really depend on the Germans. The Americans are driving the train here. The Americans basically run NATO. And you remember in December of 2021, Putin and Lavrov, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, both made it clear they were not interested in talking to NATO leaders, people like Stoltenberg. They wanted to talk to the Americans because the Americans drive the train. Furthermore, you want to understand, as I said in my earlier comments, that over the course of 2021, actually since 2014, Ukraine was becoming a de facto member of NATO. We were providing arms to Ukraine. We were training the Ukrainians, right? And we were running military exercises with the Ukrainians. And in 2021, we were explicitly saying that we were committed once again, we were saying we are committed to bringing Ukraine into NATO. And Ukraine itself, and here we're talking mainly about President Zelensky, was talking about bringing Ukraine into NATO. So the issue was very much on the table. Now, with regard to the written guarantee, I believe Biden could have given a written guarantee. I believe, by the way, the reason that the Russians wanted a written guarantee was that they didn't get a written guarantee in the 1989, 1990, 1991 period that NATO would not expand eastward. As I'm sure most of the listeners know, there's this huge debate about whether or not the West promised, here we're talking mainly about the Americans again, promised not to expand NATO eastward. I think the evidence is quite clear that we did promise not to expand NATO eastward. We didn't issue a written guarantee. And the Russians are just saying, we want a written guarantee this time. But they are sophisticated enough to understand the point that you're making, Dimitri, which is that one president can issue such a decree, but it's not going to last in a subsequent administration for sure. It could you know, be rejected by Biden's successor. But they wanted a written guarantee this time. They just wanted it on paper. Now, your final point is that there is no way, given the way this was presented, that the Americans could accept it. I think that's correct. There's no way that Biden could accept this. I think the Russians understood that. I think they hoped that maybe the Americans would change course and they wouldn't be so contemptuous of the Russians. They would appreciate what their security concerns are. But I find it hard to believe that the Russians seriously thought that Joe Biden would do a 180 degree turn on this issue. And of course, Tony Blinken basically gave him the high sign. And the end result is that on February 24th, they invaded Ukraine. Yeah, I have a slightly different take on the latter part here. Um, and first of all, I agree, obviously, that a written guarantee is ultimately not ironclad. It can be torn up, it can be broken, and the Russians know that. But nonetheless, a written guarantee would have made it more difficult for the United States to reverse course later and try and go back to bringing Ukraine in. First of all, if we had pledged in some kind of written fashion not to do that, then reversing course later on would have caused real problems for our allies in Europe, which have already always been somewhat ambivalent about Ukrainian membership, to say the least. So it raises the bar. You would get more people in the United States saying, maybe this isn't such a hot idea, we're breaking our word, etc. Doesn't make it impossible, but from a Russian point of view, you would have liked some kind of pledge, some kind of written guarantee, because it does make it more difficult. Not impossible 
little bit more difficult to go back on your word later on. Second, I actually think, you know, if we had been really clever about this, we might have been able to work out a kind of a deal. There's no question that the Biden administration and the rest of NATO did not want to be seen as giving in to Russian pressure. They didn't want to be seen as succumbing to blackmail, right? And that was a huge problem. And you could argue is even worse in the wake of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, because now Biden would get accused. What you had to do was try to transform the negotiation from a situation of blackmail giving into threats to one of essentially mutual back scratching, where we'll give Russia something it wants, namely Ukrainian neutrality, but only if Russia gives us some things we want. And then that has to be presented to the world and to the American people as not backing down to threats, but rather working out a mutually beneficial agreement. I don't know if that would have been possible, but that's the way you would have had to try and do it. If you had seen what was coming, Right. And wanted to head it off. So early into the war, Biden gave a speech where he said that he wanted to make it absolutely clear that NATO would not step on Ukrainian soil, but that if the Russians were to step onto NATO soil, that it would be, quote, World War Three. Do you feel that this is where we are going, that the scale of the conflict or conflicts that will emerge from this initial invasion will ultimately be on the scale of something similar, more similar to the previous world wars than to any proxy wars of the last century or so? Well, I would just say I find it hard to imagine we're going to have anything like World War I or World War II simply because we're dealing with nuclear armed states. The United States is not going to engage in a three or four year war with Russia that ends up with Russia being decisively defeated. I believe nuclear weapons will be used before you get to that point. Well, I would, just to clarify, that falls within the spectrum of World War III in my mind, a nuclear holocaust. <laughs> Depends on exactly what the specifics you're talking about. If you're talking about an all-out nuclear exchange, yes. If you're talking about the demonstrative use of a single nuclear weapon for purposes of trying to you know, bring the war to an end or something like that, which, by the way, would still be extremely dangerous and a crime of immense proportions. But those are two very different things. I think what we have to worry about here is, first of all, Putin using nuclear weapons in Western Ukraine. I mean, you want to understand that there's a distinction between nuclear use and nuclear war. And Putin could use nuclear weapons inside of Ukraine. He could explode three nuclear weapons in Western Ukraine, all for the purpose of saying to the West, either you stop supplying the Ukrainians or I'll use more nuclear weapons. And the consequences are unknown. That's the first thing we have to worry about. The second thing we have to worry about is that the Americans get dragged in to what is either a conventional war that then escalates to the nuclear level, or the Americans get dragged in to a war that has already turned nuclear inside of Ukraine. And the problem that we face here, Dimitri, is that we're not sure how this one will play itself out over time. We're in the realm of uncertainty here. And when you're in the realm of uncertainty and nuclear weapons are a real possibility, it's a cause for truly serious concern, right? So again, I don't worry about a world war that looks like World War I or World War II. I worry about your version of World War III, right? And even less significant, but nevertheless terribly significant scenarios like the Russians using nuclear weapons and the Americans getting dragged in. I want to amplify that just by pointing out something that uh, I believe uh, the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, said today in testifying at the Senate Armed Services Committee. She said, we continue to believe that President Putin would probably only authorize the use of nuclear weapons if he perceived an existential threat to the Russian state or his regime. And then she was asked what he would consider an existential threat. And she said, 
It included believing he was going to lose in Ukraine and that NATO is either intervening or about to intervene. Now, NATO has intervened not with troops on the ground, but with lots of support for the Ukrainians, and everyone understands why that's taking place. But it's not hard to imagine at some point where Putin would regard that as the, facing a catastrophic defeat, possibly a threat to his regime, and he would then begin to consider other options, because that is what major powers often do when they're losing or when they're even not winning as fast as they would like to. I think this is a extremely dangerous prospect that we need to take seriously. Do I think nuclear use is likely like greater than 50 percent? No. I still think it's very unlikely, but it's high enough and the consequences, if it happens, are sufficiently grave that one wants to go to great lengths to decrease the probability and bring the war to an end as quickly as possible. Can I just add just a couple words to what Steve said? Haynes said that the United States helping Ukraine to defeat Russia inside of Ukraine is an existential threat. You want to understand that American policy is not simply to defeat Russia in Ukraine. It's also to strangle the Russian economy. And according to General Austin, the Secretary of Defense, effectively knock the Russians out of the ranks of the great powers. This is an existential threat. The idea that we are doing this, that this is American policy against a country that has thousands of nuclear weapons that are aimed at us, is to me truly frightening. I cannot help but think about how President Kennedy managed the Cuban Missile Crisis. His goal from the get-go was to shut that crisis down before we got incinerated. The last thing he wanted was a general thermonuclear war. President Biden is going in exactly the opposite direction. He is upping the ante. He is threatening the survival of a nuclear armed adversary. So both of you took this conversation exactly to where I would like it to go, which is to address what feels like a, a disjointed set of policies. I mean, the quote, I forget who you were quoting, Stephen, but the idea that you would, on the one hand, recognize that there is th risk of nuclear war should the Russian state or Putin feel an existential threat, and at the same time recognizing that the prospect of loss in Ukraine could represent that existential threat, the idea that you don't put those two things together to recognize that this is where you are is confusing to me. There are a lot of people, again, in the world we live in today, a lot of what I take in information-wise comes through Twitter, but there are a lot of prominent people either who are part of this administration officially or who have played roles in previous democratic administrations who have made some really radical statements during the course of this conflict, including things like suggesting that NATO should enforce a no-fly zone. I'm curious what your thoughts are about those things. Well, one, this disjointed policy relationship, this observation that there appear to be radicals within the administration and outside of it pushing for certain policies that could really quickly escalate the situation to levels that we've always agreed are just unacceptable. And then the last point, which speaks of something that John said, which I've thought about quite a bit, which is that the Cold Warriors, the generation that managed us through the Cold War, entered that phase having just fought in and lived through and survived the most destructive war in human history. And coupled with the display of the awful power of nuclear weapons in Japan. I wonder if we're not at a place today where our leaders are so divorced from that period and so unfamiliar with the visceral consequences of nuclear war that they are taking risks that their predecessors would have been unthinkable. That's a great point. I mean, first of all, I think some of the enthusiasm for going more, uh, expanding war aims, whatever you want to call it in the United States, is this desire to punish Russia, the sense that they're doing horrible things in Ukraine and we'd like to see the army defeated, the economy collapsed and Putin overthrown and, you know, on trial. And this goes along with what we've talked about a little bit before, this tendency to demonize Russia completely, which of course gets us off the hook for having 
having played any role in bringing about this particular tragedy as well. So that's, I think, one reason you see some people in the foreign policy community going that direction. There's also a remarkable inconsistency in the way that Putin is often described. On the one hand, he's described as irrational, trapped in a bubble, paranoid, a megalomaniac, has these imperial dreams, etc. But at the same time, he's described as a calm, rational person who you push around and he won't escalate. Well, it seems to me if he's as wild and crazy a person as you think he is, part of the time, you want to be really careful about painting him into a corner. So there's some inconsistency there. And then finally, I think your last point about the sense of impunity with which the U.S. government may be acting here is really worrisome. You're exactly right. The World War II generation, you know, who'd been in combat, who'd seen what it was like, who understood how military organizations operated and understood that they're imperfect, crude organizations in lots of different ways. I think they approached the prospect of major war with a great deal of sobriety. If you read Fred Logoval's biography of JFK, it's quite clear that his World War II experiences gave him a certain skepticism about what he was told by military experts, a certain wariness about dealing with that. I don't think the current generation of people in American foreign policy appreciate that as much because after all, the United States hasn't been touched directly by any of the great adventures and misadventures we've gotten into. American soldiers have suffered mightily, but all the damage has been elsewhere. It's been in Afghanistan. It's been in Iraq. It's been far away from America's shores. And I'm not sure people have a sufficient appreciation for how a conflict like the one that is currently happening in Ukraine can go south very quickly, precisely because you're dealing with a major power, a conflict right on its border, and a conflict where its leaders believe their future is at stake. And that's a very dangerous combination to be playing around with. I just say very quickly, in the community that Steve and I operate in, it's the older people, the people in my generation and Steve's generation, who are really scared about where the Ukraine crisis is going. And most of the young people, I think it's too strong to say they're cavalier about the possibility of nuclear use, but it comes close to that. And I think it has to do with the fact that they grew up during the unipolar moment, when there was a real powerful sense that the United States could do pretty much anything it wanted, even if it was foolish, and there was no real price to pay. We had immunity, right? And furthermore, you didn't have to think about nuclear war between great powers, because there was only one great power in the system, and that one great power was the United States of America. When we grew up, Steve and I, during the Cold War, there were two great powers. So we thought a great deal about the possibility of nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. People who are younger than us just have not thought about that issue at all. And I think that accounts in part for why folks are so cavalier these days. So where does that leave us? You know, there's so many more things that I'd wanted to touch on, but maybe we could just wrap them all up in this final question. Well, I guess there are two sort of ways to think about this. One, what do you think foreign pol- U.S. foreign policy should be? But then two, where do you think we are going to go? Because one, I think the conversation about what U.S. foreign policy should be is one that's always evolving and we're still not at our consensus around it. And that's going to be even more difficult given the fact that our politics in the United States are so divided and that the Biden administration is not a shoe in by any means for 2024. And then on top of all that, you have this midway pivot to Asia, which the United States has sort of been more or less, I I don't want to say clumsily moving towards, but it hasn't been a a sort of a clearly unified strategy because there've been some other pieces that have been moving. So how does this Ukraine conflict fit in and how does this whole situation evolve and where do we go from here in your views? Well, I'll take the first swing at that, I guess. I mean, I think that John and I would both agree that the United States, its foreign policy should still be fundamentally driven by trying to maintain favorable balances of power in the world. And that primarily means uh, being able to balance China effectively in Asia. One of the great questions is how the war in Ukraine is ultimately going to affect that. If it proves to be a lasting distraction 
from that enterprise, then China will be the principal beneficiary of it. And the United States won't make the sort of rebalancing, won't give Asia the time and attention it requires. And ultimately, you know, Beijing will, will benefit from that prospect. That remains to be seen. If the war gets ended relatively quickly, if China comes off looking poorly in the rest of the world's eyes, or at least in some of the rest of the world's eyes, it may work out reasonably well. That's where American foreign policy needs to go. It also uh, you know, needs to eschew the idea that we can solve a lot of problems with military intervention. It means we start going slow on trying to spread democracy around the world. We do it by the force of our example, not by the force of bayonets as well. And that, I think, still requires a rethinking uh, or a reimagining of the American foreign policy establishment, which has kind of gotten a new lease on life in the last uh, few months because the Ukraine crisis appeals to all of their most familiar instincts. And we're seeing those various things play out. I'll just add one other point, and then I'll pass this to John. And that's and your point about the American domestic politics is exactly right. I mean, what is going to determine our future more than anything else is what happens inside this country, not what some other country does to us. Again, that's assuming our earlier discussion of nuclear war turns out okay and we don't get one. It's going to be mostly what happens here at home. And the fact that you can no longer count on a solid bipartisan consensus on big foreign policy issues. You know, if Trump comes back in 2024, American foreign policy could really change again in a big way. I think that's an indication of how badly the foreign policy establishment has performed over the past 25 or 30 years. It's easy to criticize what we've been doing since 1995. It hasn't worked out the way its advocates promised. It certainly led to a world that is more dangerous than it needed to be and one where Americans are not living as well as they could have if we had managed this much more intelligently. And so the reason you get some internal disagreement on foreign policy now is because it's really hard to defend what's been going on. And I hope uh, that over the next few years, we actually continue to get a more active and wide ranging debate on this subject because, you know, the Americans have to start figuring out what's worked in the past, but also come to terms with what's failed and stop repeating the same mistakes. I think Steve gave an excellent presentation on where American foreign policy should go. But there is a different question, and that is, where will American policy actually go? And the reason I find it hard to answer where we're headed is because I don't understand in my own mind how the Ukraine crisis plays out. And the Ukraine crisis is of such central importance to the future of American foreign policy. If you think about where we are here, we have Russia, which believes it's facing an existential threat in Ukraine. And the United States is interested not simply in defeating Russia in Ukraine, it's interested in bringing the Russians to their knees, wrecking their economy, bringing them to their knees, and knocking them out of the ranks of the great powers, right? That's an existential threat. So the Russians cannot afford to lose. They're in this one to the end. Then there's the Americans. If you look at where the Biden administration is on this one, we are effectively at war with the Russians. We're not doing the fighting, but we're doing everything else. And we may end up doing the fighting. We are committed to winning this war. This means that you have two great powers that are committed to winning the war. As we all know, both sides can't win. Only one side can win. So how does this end? You have all sorts of people like General Milley and Mr. Stoltenberg, who was the head of NATO, saying that this war is going to go on for years. That's a quite remarkable statement. The idea that the United States and Russia are going to be involved in this conflagration in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, for years? I wonder if we're not going to have some sort of escalation along the way, or one side isn't going to win, and that's going to have devastating consequences. All of this is just to say it's hard to know where we're headed. 
it's easy to figure out where we should go. And there I agree with Steve. Whether we're going to be able to go down that road, I'm not sure at all, because I don't see how this one ends. I don't see what the happy ending is, to put it in very simple terms. I completely sympathize with the outrage that the public expressed. I expressed it myself at the invasion. I understand the hard line that the allies have taken against Russia in the intervening months. But at this stage, I completely agree with you. I find this policy baffling because it does put them in a, in a situation, Putin especially, where he's literally concerned about his own life because the situation could lead to him getting toppled. Last question, just, you know, again, it's up to you guys, obviously, in terms of time, but what are your views? So like a lot of people were concerned that maybe he would push for full mobilization during the his May 9th speech. That didn't happen. I'm curious if you heard that speech, what your thoughts are about it. And do you think that counterintuitively, the situation in Ukraine actually makes it even easier to pivot to Asia because it's caused unification on the part of NATO and Western allies. And it also shows just how weak the Russians are and how capable NATO allies are to resist them. I don't have a strong view on what the speech meant. I haven't done a sort of proper tea leaf reading, and I'm not sure it would be all that revealing. Mm. I think Putin is somebody who has played many of his cards pretty close to his chest, and I think he wasn't giving anything away one way or the other in that particular speech. So I'm not quite sure how to interpret that as well. I'm sorry, and your second question was? My second question was, would the does the crisis, does the conflict in Ukraine actually make the pivot to Asia easier because it shows how weak the Russians are, it bogs them down, it has unified the Western allies, et cetera? Got it. So I think strategically, yes, it makes it much easier to make the pivot because we've now seen what Russian military capabilities are really like. And the Europeans appear to be, uh, at least for today, serious about trying to develop the capabilities that they've always had the potential to put together. Politically, whether that happens, I don't know, because again, this will be seen as, you know, if it turns out okay, this will be seen as a great vindication for American leadership of the alliance. I think Europeans will immediately go back to saying, great, we want Uncle Sam to be the first responder. And it'll be a long time before the United States is able to actually make the kind of shift it should. I think with regard to the speech, I've looked at it very carefully. First of all, it's important to understand it was short. And it was mainly designed to honor those who gave their lives or those who served in World War II. And it was not going to be a speech where Putin made important policy pronouncements. The occasion did not call for that. Nevertheless, if you read the speech carefully, he makes it unequivocally clear that the issue on the table in Ukraine is NATO expansion, just as Steve and I have said here. It is NATO expansion. Now, with regard to the pivot, I believe that what we're doing in Eastern Europe and in Ukraine in particular makes it much harder to pivot to East Asia. I think it makes it much harder to pivot in terms of material forces, but also in terms of intellectual capital, in terms of the amount of bandwidth that you can spend thinking or you have available to think about dealing with the question of how best to contain China. If you go to Asia today, East Asian and our Asian allies more generally are complaining that we are not providing a blueprint that explains how we have to deal with China, how they have to deal with China. And the reason we can't do that is because we're pinned down in Eastern Europe worrying about how to deal with Ukraine. So I think the longer we stay in Eastern Ukraine, and as I said to you before, there are a number of people who think we're going to be there for years. The longer we stay in Eastern Ukraine, the more difficult it is to pivot to East Asia. Furthermore, we not only need to pivot to East Asia, if we want to contain China, we want the Russians on our side of the ledger. We don't want the Russians on their side of the ledger. But what have we done? We've driven the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. This is a violation of balance of power politics 101. We have a peer competitor in the system. That peer competitor is not Russia. That peer competitor is China. We should be focusing laser-like on China. Instead, what are we doing? We're getting into a war 
with a country that we should have as an ally, but instead we've turned into a mortal enemy. It really does make you wonder about the quality of American leadership. Where do you think the public is on this, John? Because either I mentioned it in our conversation or I certainly will have mentioned in the introduction that you went viral after this conflict because of one specific speech that you you gave at the, I think it was at the University of Chicago or maybe somewhere else. I think it has 26 million views. You have tons of other videos that have millions of views online. So you've gotten a lot of correspondence from people. One, why do you think it resonates so much? And then where do you feel the public is? And do you think there's an opportunity there for American foreign policy to open the door to Russia 50 years after opening it to China? Well, the problem with the responses that I get, and I get many, many responses to that video, is that it's not a representative sample of public opinion. Furthermore, you want to understand that a lot of the emails that I get are from abroad, especially from Europe and especially from Germany. And almost all of the emails I've gotten regarding that video are positive and people like what I have to say. This is a completely self-serving statement, but I think that the reason that people like the presentation is because it's so commonsensical. I also think a lot of people like the presentation because they don't feel they're getting an alternative narrative in the mainstream media. The mainstream media is constantly blaming Putin, constantly saying that he's an expansionist and Ukraine is the first stop on the railroad line and so forth and so on. And they are anxious to hear an alternative narrative, which I think that 2015 video provides. But whether or not this means that the public is in support of the argument that Steve and I are laying out here today is very hard to say. And I would just finally add that even if the public agrees in large part with me and Steve, I don't think it matters that much because I think the foreign policy elites in this country do pretty much what they want and they ignore the elites. As Steve likes to point out, both Barack Obama and Donald Trump were elected to change foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy, in a fundamental way. And both of them failed because the blob defeated them at almost every turn. I could speak to both of you for hours. I appreciate your time. We went a little over. Maybe we should do this. Uh, this we should do the weekly calls. We should record <laughs> them. Thank you both so much for coming on. This was really, uh, really satisfying and enlightening for me, and I'm sure it will be for my listeners. That's great. Nice talking to you, Dimitri. Yes, thank you for having us on, Dimitri. It was much fun. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>